Hello, everybody, and welcome to Atheist Sunday School, your one-stop shop for everything Atheist Sunday and school. And boy, do we have a show for you today. Today, we are covering Psalms 121 through 131. With and Landon Knoll. With Landon Knoll. Almost. Perfect there. Very good until then. Yeah, we, we, have, we have our fantastic and always intelligent, always gorgeous guest, Landon Knoll, a real scientist. Oh. <laughs> oh, I, I, I think you kind of good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending upon your time zone and latitude from your friendly second astronomer on this zombie day. And of course, I am wearing the Behold t shirt. Yes, our, our new Behold t shirts. And if you want to get one of those, it's been you the way can out. check it out on Teespring. <laughs> on Teespring, yep. So today we are covering some psalms, 11 psalms today, actually. Yeah, they're real short, though. They are very short. Like, all of these psalms together is shorter than Psalm 119. <laughs> yeah, pretty that much. That psalm had, like, part J yeah, little, up to and it with verse 40 psalms. So after little this, psalm, yes. after this, we will have three more weeks of psalms and then it's done then we're gonna be done with psalms that's says mm. the groundhog yeah and <laughs> three more weeks of psalms and then we're gonna be doing well, these, proverbs these these short psalms are also quite quite common in liturgical uh music and uh, even handles messiah there's words and phrases from here yes. so we have even though these are nice psalmy psalms they certainly have uh uh been been quite prominent in liturgical music all right well so you know we may I or have, may not recognize some of these yes i have the king james version of the bible i have the english standard version of the bible landon what kind of bible do you have and i am i am reading from the new american standard bible the reference edition a aj holman company division of Beatty Pitt Lipcott Company in Philadelphia and New York, and it's copyrighted because um, apparently God copyrighted it in 1960. <laughs> ah, well, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, we also have Robert Alter's translation the is, with commentary. The is it the... Yeah, go go ahead, Land. Yeah. The problem with, with, with Bible copyrights is the Bible copyright is that they last, you know, 75 years after the death of the author. And if God is dead, <laughs> then it's gone. If God's got died, then it's still copyrighted. All right. Yeah, we got to, we got to ask. But, uh, but, but wait, let's, let's, let's see, let's see whether it's zombie Jesus comes back up and does a DCM takedown for, you know, using his copyrighted material. Yeah, we'll see. He'll do it. He'll come after he, he'll you. He'll definitely prop up eventually. But you were just, you were just. Yep. You're describing the great tomes of uh, of works on your desk, so I, I interrupted. I apologize. All right. Uh, we also have Eerdman's commentary on the Bible. Yes. We also have the Holy Scriptures, according to some Jews, and the New King James Version. We also have Witherington's Psalms, Old and New, and the Origins of Biblical Monotheism you know, by wanna, Mark S. Smith. I want to pan the camera back and forth. Is that cool? Don't. I mean, just just go up there and move it once and twice just to show the books. Why, There's so will, many books. They'll see all the books eventually. Will they? Yes. But they can't appreciate how many there are. <laughs> There's a I good don't... amount of Let's see. One, two, three, <laughs> seven, 11, plus these three. So that's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 19 books. Okay, well. Yep. All right, I Incl guess including the Bibles. There yeah. you go. But they're fat, and it'd be cool if you yeah. saw them. Whatever. Well, either way. You know, someday... Folks, Lawrence will let me do things. <laughs> you want to see the books? I'll show you the books. Here's some books. Why, why are you, why are you some doing this? Yes, it's like going to be annoying. It's going to be annoying to move them back. Here's some books. You can do it, Lawrence. Does that pop up? A little. Okay, well, they're Ooh. here. There's a lot of books. Faith. You got to have faith that there are books there, guys. Yep. And anyways, we can hop right into the readings. How about we get started with Psalm 121? Yep. Psalm 121. 
A song of degrees. <laughs> we were just well, talking that? about that. Now, mine says a song of ascents. Mine says a song of ascents as ah. opposed to degrees. Yeah, song of ascents. The Lord so, is keeper of Israel. So th- this is actually a good chunk of the stuff we'll be covering. So we kind of started the songs of ascent last week, mm-hmm. but there are still quite a few more. And we're going to be going over the majority of them today. So, uh, from Alter, those scholars who think that the Songs of Ascents are psalms framed for pilgrims to Jerusalem see here a specific reference to the, uh, and actually that's in the first uh, first verse, but they uh, see a specific reference to the mountains around Jerusalem and imagine that the going and coming of the last line refer to the pilgrim's departure from Jerusalem after coming to the temple to travel through the potentially dangerous Judite uh, hill country. So, uh, of course, the Psalms of Ascent are you know meant to be, or a lot of people think they were viewed for the pilgrimage to, to Jerusalem. Yeah. Uh, which we talked about briefly last week. We did, yes, very with, briefly. Uh, Siberia and another place being a good analogy to how far people were to travel. Remember that on their pilgrimage? Did we talk about Siberia? I it was remember. an analogy in one of the... Um, I don't think we even talked about Siberia. Definitely. definitely Probably would have remembered Siberia. It wasn't in the readings. It was in one of the translations. Oh, okay. Talking as an analogy for how far people would travel uh, gotcha. to get... To Jerusalem and therefore an ascent. Okay. Yes. I guess. Well, why don't I just get us started then? Well, uh, just just to note about this uh, first psalm, it was not originally written as a pilgrim song. the The hills spoken of in twelve one are not the hills uh, in which the pilgrims had to cross on their journey to Jerusalem. In view of the polemic qualities that are evident in the rest of the psalm, uh, hills should also be interpreted in a polemic sense, namely as the dwelling place of the gods. Uh, consequently, verse 1 is a rhetorical question which ex- uh, which expects a negative answer, namely that one's help does not come from the hills, that is, from the gods. Okay. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills... From whence cometh in my help? There's no question mark in the King James Version. Uh, well, there is a question mark uh, in this one. <laughs> is there in the ESV? Is mine. Uh, what did you say about yours? Does it have it? Uh, yeah, mine, mine, mine has a question mark. Yes, yeah, so that's mine actually. In the uh, in the original Hebrew, there were 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 they? Did they have question marks? I don't think they or was had. It just implied. I don't think they had punctuation. Did they? Uh, it was implied. Yeah. Same with Greek. Greek didn't. I mean, yeah. uh, it, it was called a scriptio continua because it was continuous script. They didn't have spaces or any of that stuff. You just kind of had to figure it out. You know, like you ever see Chinese? <laughs> uh, yes, I've seen Chinese. Yeah, it's uh, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's no like spaces or anything to work with. At least not in the old. Old Chinese. Sure. I, I tried once, remember? That was funny. Yeah. My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold! Behold! Landon, behold! There we go. Beautiful. Amazing. He that keepeth Israel. Yeah, let's, let's get some beholds in the chat, too. Yes, oh, yeah. always. Don't Loving get banned, though. <laughs> Loving those beholds. <laughs> he that mm. keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. So verses uh, 3 and 4 also contain strong polemic elements, whereas the fertility gods mm. are subject to the cycle of nature, uh, die annually, and then come to life again. The Lord is always active. He is alive. He is not asleep. And he is always capable of coming to his people's assistance. But he chooses not to several times. You, you, you know. Yeah, you know, you, know, yeah. you just got to wave well, that away. 
The Lord is thy keeper, the Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The Mm. sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. That's Um, a very interesting The moon is a really smitey smitey object, right? I don't I don't think that anyone's been uh like I got a got a got a moon burn. Uh, from yes, the actually, full moon. Landon, someone so has quite, had a moon I'm not burn. Quite seeing the. <laughs> uh, so there is a note here, well, on I mean, on that. If... <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go ahead, Landon. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. That's fine. Yeah. Well, is it a polemic against the sun gods and moon gods? Well, Alter says that the dead metaphor of shade is resuscitated in this notion of protection from sunstroke, a real danger in the semi-desert climate of the land of Israel. And then on the moon by night, in all likelihood, these words refer to the danger of being moonstruck, evidently thought to be a cause of madness in ancient Israel. Oh, as lunacy. It, yeah, lu- <laughs> lunacy. <laughs> that's good stuff. Uh, lunacy, that's good. Uh, which was thought to be a cause of madness in ancient Israel as it has been imagined in many cultures. So that's the note on that. Okay. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And that's the end of Psalm 121. Hey, if you're enjoying this, give us a like. Yeah, subscribe if you haven't. All that good stuff. Very Send it short, to your friends. Very short psalm. Share it around. Get people here and talking and yeah, we like that stuff. Send it to everyone you know in quarantine. Absolutely, especially the people in quarantine. And the people who aren't. Yeah, the, they can watch it on their phones. That's fine. Yep. <laughs> All right, so how about we hop into Psalm 122? Yeah. All right, here, I, I should probably give you this. Yeah, give me that. Yeah, and then this, this as well. All right, let's start Psalm 122. Now, oh. now this one... This one is it claims to be a song of a sense of David. Mm-hmm. So, so do we know it's actually of David? Uh, I think there might be a note on that. Mm-hmm. Walter Edmonds. Alter does not comment on it. Um, Edmonds says Psalm one twenty two is the only one of the songs of a sense in which there is a specific mention of a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. I guess that happens in the first two verses, but it does not specifically say anything about, anything David? about David. It okay. does say um, the house of the Lord is placed in the first and last verses. So that's a, yeah, a yeah. bookend. Yeah, so it makes, psalm. makes sense that that would be an ascent thing. Mm-hmm. So but a song. I'm going to start reading here. Okay. A song of a sense of David. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. So I think it's actually kind of interesting here that it says that it's a song of a sense of David, but it's probably, uh, you know, people who more likely had a lot of uh, admiration towards David Mm -hmm. because there was no house of the Lord. He didn't build the house of the Lord. That was Solomon. Right. Yeah. Um, No. And, and, and and it might, so instead of of David, I might say, uh, you know, in memory of David or about David or something like that, as opposed to. Sure. Mm -hmm. By Um, David. It says says of David, so it's not necessarily by David, I guess, the implication. Exactly. Mine says for David. Ah, for David. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, But it says, uh, well, it kind of echoes the same thing in Eerdman's here, basically saying that this is the only song of a sense that's actually about pilgrimage. (laughs) Jerusalem, built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel. So, 
um, the tribes of the Lord, that's the tribes of Yah. And also where it says joined fast together. Uh, the most probable reference is to the fortifications of Jerusalem or specifically to the protective wall that encloses it. Um, so where the tribes go up, go up is the technical verb for pilgrimage. Uh, Jerusalem as the locus of the central cult is envisioned here as the focus of national unity. Uh, it makes it highly likely that this psalm was composed sometime after the centralization of the cult in Jerusalem by King Josiah around 621 BCE. That would make sense. Cause, I mean, so far we <coughs> haven't run into anything that's too exilic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, either way, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord, their thrones for judgment were Ooh. set. The thrones of the house of David. So for, the Hebrew mm. says, for the thrones of judgment sit. With the use of the verb perhaps encouraged by the fact that one sits on a throne, it is noteworthy that cultic centrality is here joined with the centralization of judicial authority and implicitly of political authority as well in the Davidic dynasty's capital. This is very much in line with Josiah's program. Mm. Pray for peace of Jerusalem. May they be secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. Mm. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, Peace be within you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So, it says peace a lot. It does. The word peace, which is shalom. Wait, like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much the one Hebrew word everybody knows. <laughs> uh, it plays the central part in verses 6 through 8, where it occurs three times. It has to do with the peace and prosperity of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's fate is her citizens' fate as well. If the city prospers, the inhabitants prosper too. The citizens of Jerusalem should therefore strive for peace as well as petition the Lord for peace. Jerusalem is not only a symbol of the Lord's presence, but also a symbol of the people's welfare. The psalm ends as it began, namely with the concept of Jerusalem as the house of the Lord. The main theme of Psalm 122 is that Jerusalem is where God is. So I think it would definitely make sense as a pre-exilic psalm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Anyways, that's actually the end of Psalm 122. Yeah, very short psalms today. Landon. Ooh. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's up to you for Psalm 123. Psalm. Yeah. Okay, so Psalm 123, a nice number, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's a, it says, my, it says it's a prayer for the Lord's help, a song of ascents. Mm -hmm. Any other commentary before I get into the uh, this four-verse little psalmy psalm? Well, uh, the, the, um, the KJV and the Robert Alter version only call them songs of ascents or degrees in the KJV. Yeah, I also have a just song of ascents. Yeah. All right. So Psalm 123. To thee I lift up my eyes, O thou who art enthroned in the heavens. Behold! Behold! Behold. Uh. <laughs> As the eyes of the servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of their mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord God until he is gracious to us. So with uh, this bit that you just Be gracious read. gracious to us. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, it says, um, like the eyes of slaves right. to their masters, and mm -hmm. later, like the eyes of a slave girl to her mistress. It says in the altar commentary, 
In the affecting simplicity of this compact psalm, virtually the only metaphor one may exclude the weak metaphoric force of Satan in verses 3 and 4 is this comparison with the abject dependency of the slave upon their master. It is formulaic in the parallelism of biblical poetry that if Eved, slave or servant, appears in the first verset, Shifchach, or Amach, slave girl or handmaiden, appears in the second verset. Here, however, the extension to the other gender conveys a sense of inclusiveness. Everyone in this community, man and woman, looks urgently to God for a sign of grace. I feel like the the inclusivity thing might just be reading into it more than you should. Yeah, like th- that's a little postulation. Yeah. I, well, especially if you put everyone at that level. Yeah. Right. Uh, but yeah, as as we noticed that yeah. that stanza starts with you know to you I lift up my eyes and it ends with so our eyes look to the Lord our God, uh, and in the middle it has the whole uh, you know looking at the the hands of their masters pretty much. Uh, but yeah, as you noted. Uh, that yeah. it was the description of or the use of the word eyes to develop the themes of trust in and reliance on God. Uh, that's pretty much what it's used for. In fact, there's a there's a little division here. I won't talk about it too much, but yeah, it it does uh, parallel each other. It has an A B B A kind of um, what's the word I'm looking for? Rhyme scheme or just scheme in general? Meter, <laughs> meter, sure, okay. That's what we got going on here. Meter, yeah. Yeah. Um, But with the I lift up my eyes bit, Alter uh, basically says that this uh, makes it a psalm of supplication. Unlike some of the previous ones. Sure. So, yeah, this is more of a So, anyway. Yeah. Verse 3. Be gracious to us, O Lord. Be gracious to us. For we are greatly filled with contempt. Our soul is greatly filled with the scoffing of those who are at ease and with the contempt of the proud. Ooh, Alter says the smug. The smug? Yeah, the contempt of the smug. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I have really no end notes for that, but. Uh, from Erdman's, uh, most exegetes date Psalm 123 to the post-exilic period and relate the psalm to the oppression endured by the people of God under Persian rule. Uh, you know, it's under Persian rule. They were generally okay under Persian rule. I mean, they got the temple back. Yeah, well, uh, Alter yeah. says, unlike other supplications where the cause of the complaint is specified, slander, illegitimate lawsuits, schemes against the life of the speaker, etc. All we're told here at the end of the psalm is that the collective supplicants have been treated with contempt by persons identified only as smug. <laughs> uh, a triadic line is used at mm. the end as a marker of closure. Uh, and then Erdmans continues on uh, saying, but here there is no direct evidence which uh, permits exact dating. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, you know, this is... Being a short and generally vague supplication psalm, yeah. I could see it being used in liturgical services pretty often. Yeah, definitely. Either way, uh, that was the end of Psalm 123. If you guys are enjoying the stream so far, please drop a like, subscribe. If you haven't, share it around with all your friends and family and you know your mom and your dad and your cat and your dog. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and if you're a ham you're radio, right, right. click the click the thumbs up. <laughs> if you're a ham radio operator, uh, convert our live stream link into Morse code uh-huh. and send it off on all frequencies. Wow. You'll waste all the yeah. Air do time do that. <laughs> of people who need it. Yep. Anyways, I think uh, it's off to you then. Yeah. Yep, yep, it's my turn. I got Psalm 124, a song of degrees of David. As we went over before, yeah. the ascents is... And I, and I said a powers of two, by the way. You see, mm. it says sending and powers of two, one, two, four. See? 
Uh, and apparently Psalm 124 is a communal song of thanksgiving. It is, however, not clear to which specific historical event the psalm owes its origin. Well, maybe we can figure it out. Well, maybe it's a vague one yeah. again. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick when their wrath was kindled against us. Then the waters had overwhelmed us. The stream had gone over our soul. Then the proud waters had gone over our soul. So I think that for this section, it's pretty clear that without the help of God, the powers of nature will will take over pretty much. Mm-hmm. Um, so on the very first verse, Alter notes, uh, you know, were, were it not the Lord who was for us, uh, let Israel now say. The second of the two versets is a formal exhortation, probably on the part of a... Uh, leader of a choir, uh, to the community of worshipers to chant the words of the liturgical text that begins in the first verse set and continues in verse 2 through to the end of the psalm. This is a collective thanksgiving psalm, as is noted. Uh, The Hebrew, with its abundant use of incremental repetition, has has a strong rhythmic character that would have lent itself to singing or chanting. Mm. Yeah, I can see that. Mm-hmm. It also uses the um, water imagery. It a- does. As a metaphor for, like, crushing, defeat, etc. Yeah. Uh, which makes me wonder why. Because, you know, every time that we've had water imagery in the Moses story or, like, in the books of the Torah, right? It's generally been a good thing. Well, right? you could say generally, sure. That's because just water is good like overall. Bes- beside the flood, which existed before this there's, people there's, existed. There's the flood, and there's also, you know, the it was without form and void, and, you know, these these chaos right. waters. The, the Watery the abyss. Yeah. Tiamat. But, uh, yeah, like... Usually in the stories, the waters are used for the advantage of the people. So um, besides just the Egyptians, um, there was also the Jordan, and there was also a lot of military encounters where they explicitly used the different rivers um, to their advantage and were able to defeat opponents because of their placements. Um, So I find it strange. Well, so on this altar notes, these two lines are an especially effective use of the emphatic structure of incremental repetition. Uh, Verse four displays a semantic parallelism without verbal repetition in its two halves. Uh, Waters, torrents swept us up, uh, come up past our necks. Then uh, 5A... Uh, repeats come up past our necks and 5B repeats the waters and uh, yeah from 4A uh, adding the ejectival increment raging and uh, so producing a climactic effect being engulfed by a raging torrent is a metaphor for near death duh uh, picked up from the psalms of individual supplication and thanksgiving Mm -hmm. I guess I just don't have any idea where you could place this well, in the timeline. Yeah, in the timeline, I, I wouldn't know, but this uh, ex- this is from Erdman's. This extended uh, conditional sentence, because, of course, like, you know, without, uh, without God on our side, all this stuff would have happened, so mm-hmm. it's conditional. Uh, this extended conditional sentence, together with the use of metaphors, you know, wild animals, devouring fire, raging waters, uh, emphasizes... On the one hand, the threat and danger to which the people were subjugated, or sorry, subjected, 
and on the other, the intervention of the Lord and his deliverance. The metaphors evoke associations with the mythological forces of chaos. The Lord is able to protect his people against all these forces. Deliverance was possible only because God was on their side. Mm. All right. Um, Blessed be the Lord who hath not given us as a prey to their teeth. Now the waters have teeth. Uh, our soul. Yes. <laughs> chomp, chomp. Yeah, yeah. Because, because now we're talking about, the, we're getting into the wild animal imagery stuff. Is it? Mm. Yeah. Um, it's very abrupt, too. It is, yep. Um, we go directly from water imagery. There's no, like, bridging the gap. Uh, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we are escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. So there's not much of the animal imagery. There is more water imagery than animal yeah. imagery. Yeah. So there is a, a little... Kind of, I think they kind of stretch that that analogy a bit. Mm-hmm. They do definitely. I think they kind of stretch that analogy a bit. It's, it's like it's like they they got tired of waters, which was both substance substance thing, and decided to throw in a few stuff. I mean, know? I can make a mm-hmm. analogy between the tips of the water, where it's you know it foamy and white, as the teeth, and that that's intimidating because that's you know choppy. I don't know. What, it's a guess. It's a stretch. <laughs> hey, the, everything the, about the, it the, is. You have to incorporate the snare. And and, he, and how do you incorporate the snare in the water? No, I think I think they just kind of like got bored and tried to do something and said, "Yeah, well." Well, for- you, you you know the average attention span of the reader at the time was really short. They were they were so indulged in all that reading they were doing. <laughs> yeah, uh, all that Twitter uh, activity. Yeah, yeah right. definitely. They were on Twitter the whole time. That's why they talk about birds and snares. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so the. Alter notes that uh, the concluding line is quite close to Psalm 121.2. And in general, some mm. exchange of language is noticeable among the various songs of ascent. The imposition of the name of the Lord between God and Israel as a kind of mediation is a development that becomes progressively pronounced in the second temple period. So that's really the only hint we have at dating. Second temple period. Yeah, no wonder I can't figure it out. <laughs> All right. Anyways, uh, now it's my turn now to, to read again. Turn. What are we on then? Psalm 125? Yep. yep. 125, that's a, nice, that's a very nice round number. And it's also one eighth of a thousand, so. <laughs> Good number. <laughs> Thank you for the math knowledge. <laughs> All right. Um, this psalm. Oh, it gets better. <laughs> it's um it's gonna have a lot of contrasting language, uh, typical of wisdom literature. Ah, fantastic! I love wisdom literature. <laughs> so this psalm, with its distinctive wisdom characteristics, probably reflects the struggle of the post-exilic Judean community to survive, but also shows their faith in God as the only source of help and protection. Uh, thank you, Flip. One hundred and seventeen thousand one hundred. Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm yes. sure. Landon already has like a name for that specific number because he was talking. He was. Uh, we were on a stream yesterday. We were in, uh, doing uh, rum and coke night on uh, Steve's channel, and uh, he was talking about naming a whole bunch of numbers. So I'm guessing he already has a name for this one specifically. <laughs> there you go. Yep. 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 Uh, so two dollars. Thank you very much for that. And yes, th- thank you so much. We are nearly done with our alchemy drive. Yeah, we are very close. We are now uh, ten dollars and eleven cents away uh, from from so doing alchemy. Yeah. Also, something just got in my eye, and I don't know what. So it is. someone, Dust. someone were to donate ten dollars and eleven cents or more. Hmm. Then what would happen? Ah, well, then we, we would, would attempt alchemy. Yeah, we would definitely attempt alchemy. That I mean, we attempted to summon a demon. <laughs> now, research I, begins. <laughs> I looked into some things, and apparently, I've got to melt some lead and throw some gold shavings in there. 
and then uh, like take some powderized solid mercury and throw it into the molten lead. These things will be a little annoying to get. <laughs> I I'm well, not I'm sure. Well, I'm not going to say healthy. anything about anything, I'm, but I may or may not have some of what you're referring yeah, to. Yeah, mercury drops But but if yeah, you if you do it under a hood, you might be able to a ventilation hood. Mm. Yeah. I said we needed that Oof. from the beginning and Oof. nobody believed me. <laughs> there are cheaper outdoor vent hoods. I believe you. <laughs> okay, fine. I excluded yes. Landon because you're too rational. Yes. I didn't want to clump you in there. <laughs> well, hopefully we don't get poisoned. Anyway, so, so please consider the donation of, of at least $10.11. <laughs> that would be nice yeah. this time. It'll go towards us not getting poisoned. That would be nice, yeah, not getting curious. poisoned. We have gold and we have lead, believe it or not. <laughs> I know we do. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, it's lead is really uncommon. It's, oh, so it's, it's it's looking for mercury compounds. Well, there may be ways you can do that that are not so toxic. Maybe. I, I have a small clump of uh, mercury vials because they're, you know, old thermometers. Oh, okay. I believe I have about three, and they probably have about two or three grams in them each because they're big. Mm, interesting. Wow, look yeah, at that. You Grab your... Oh, my oh, gosh. Oh, here oh we go. Boy. We're making oh, gold. Man. Thank you, Flip. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that is much appreciated. Thank you. Now we are at $666. Whoa. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank we appreciate you. that. Thank All right. You, thank you. Thank you. Let's... Thank uh, you, thank you, thank <laughs> I guess we're going to make you. some gold, boys. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. All right. We'll give it a go. Uh I got to get that 3D printer, too, so that I can, like, help make parts for this because it's not going to be easy to get some of the stuff. Yeah. yeah, we need, like, heavily heat-resistant things. We need, like, a forge. <laughs> I wanted to be a blacksmith once in a while ago. Well, we could do it at Renfair or something. Hey, you they know got it. Yeah, years from we now. Could, uh -huh. It's not that difficult to set up a brick forge in the backyard. We could set up a forge in the backyard. No. And, no. Yeah. I guess we could, uh, well, we could do that. Your backyard's bigger, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. I know how to lay bricks. <laughs> That's something we can Anyways. do. Though. They're making gold or something like that. Yeah. So, We're going to try. Yes, 125. A song uh, of a sense. The Lord surrounds us people. Yes. Yes. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abides forever. So, this psalm. Which, Except for Cottonelle Drift. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. But this Psalm, Psalm debunked. Uh, <laughs> like the other songs of Ascents, uh, appears to have been composed in the exilic or immediately post-exilic period. It expresses a national sense of trust in God despite the domination of an oppressive foreign power. The rod of wickedness in verse 3, which we'll get to. Uh, the Israelite community as a whole, is represented as the righteous. Jerusalem and the temple may have been laid waste by the Babylonian invaders, but the solid persistence of the mountain on which the city was built is a token of the perdurability of the people that made its capital on this mountain. Most translations render Settled here is endure. He says, um, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, never shaken, settled forever. Uh, uh, most translations have settled here as endure, stand or abide. Although, by a small stretch, the Hebrew verb, uh, Y-S-H-B, yishp, <laughs> Could have that meaning. It is re repeatedly used in the call conjugation as here to mean be settled. See, among other examples, Joel 420. And Judah will be settled. Teshev, exactly as here, forever. The point is that Mount Zion not only will stand solid forever, 
but will continue to be a place of habitation despite the exile of some of its population. Yeah, so I think having this as uh, a post-exilic psalm would actually make more sense because when they're saying that it's it's unmovable, mm-hmm. uh, suggest that right now it ain't moving. Yeah. But, but you are. Oh. Oh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the, uh, yeah, mm. lest the righteous stretch out their hands to do wrong. So uh, it's it conditional. Says, yes. Uh, Unless, of course, they, they don't. Uh, it says the rod of wickedness. Don't get rid of the high places. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. High places. Uh, it says for the rod of wickedness will not rest on the portion of the righteous. Uh, the wording here, the word for portion, goral, is repeatedly used in Joshua and occasionally in Numbers for the division of the land according to the tribes. The portion of the territory of Judah may have been usurped by invaders, but this is not a condition that will persist. Mm. And I think uh, one of the things that that kind of goes towards a post-exilic notion is, you know, in in that period, they were blaming themselves for Mm. the exile, as is shown so much throughout the... the Deuteronomistic history and, you know, even in uh, the Torah as well. So much through that, this just fits in perfectly with it. You know, uh, that the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous unless they do wrong. Mm. Do good, O Lord, to those who are good and to those who are upright in their hearts. But those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead us lead away with evil doers. Peace be upon Israel. All right, and that is uh, that's the end of the the psalm with uh, an invocation. Yeah, <laughs> yes. And hey, magic spells. I I hear something. Do you? I I do hear something. <laughs> Have a static, maybe. Is yeah. Wrong with the mics? There, there might be. This is crazy. Whoa. Is it? Is it up? No. No. Put it up. Behold, I am your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I want to let all you heathens and sinners know that I support this wonderful episode of Atheist Sunday School. Lawrence and Reuben try their very best to bring you the true glory of the Bible, and they need your help. They have provided links to their Patreon page and other social media just for you. Once again, my name is Jesus Christ, and this is Milwaukee Atheists. The Lord is with them. God bless. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Jesus, for showing wow. up on your day of resurrection. Yep. This Welcome back. Oh. This Easter. You look pretty good for a zombie. Yep. <laughs> pretty, pretty good. Pretty good for a zombie, I must admit. Yeah. And I, I knew he'd show up. I told you at the start of the show he'd do that. Oh, he always yeah. shows up on Easter. Yeah, always. That's like when he's supposed to do that. Yep. So... Either way, uh, Landon, I believe this next psalm, Psalm 126, is uh, it's all yours. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and 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 and, and just in the same theme, 126 is a is the smallest multi-digit number, such as the sum of its prime factor without repetition equals the product of its digits. So its prime factors without repetition are are two, three, and seven, and you. Add those up, you get twelve. And if you multiply the digits one times two times one times two times six, you get twelve. So it's the smallest multi-digit number that does that. So I don't think the psalmist considered that when he made it one twenty-six, but but I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh he knew. Giving it, 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 it's it's a Thanksgiving return from captivity, a song of a sense. Mm-hmm. 
All right. When the Lord brought back. Oh, you want to mention something before we go? Uh, I don't really have anything to mention. Any other things that... Yeah, I got nothing. I'm going to have stuff to add in here oh. with every verse except for the third verse. Oh. Uh, so just uh, give me a pause after each verse. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. So he says Zion's fortunes in Robert Alter's translation. The Hebrew Shivat ostensibly returned, though in the King James Version and other translations it's rendered as captivity, is a mistake for either Shavut or Shavit as in verse 4, both attested to in various Hebrew manuscripts. The term means previous condition. Precisely this idiom for the restoration of a previous condition is used at the end of Job 42.10. The English rendering of the term as fortunes is adopted from the new Jewish publication society. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we got that. Oh, no, that's, back. that's the old oh, that's the one. Old one. Okay. Oh. We got the new one. Yeah. We should get the new one. <laughs> but yeah. That's all he has to say about that. All right. No. Let's continue. Okay. Then our mouth was filled with laughter yeah. and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said amongst the nations, the Lord has come, done great things. Yeah, so has done great things. Now, to me, that shows that this is in the past tense. Uh, so he just did something amazing. And of course, we're talking about restoration as well. So he restored something. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Alter says the prayer for the re restoration of natural national fortunes in verse four is a strong argument that the fulfillment indicated here has to take place um, in exile. Huh. Okay. So that yeah, that's that's really weird. So okay, so Erdman's notes kind of a similar thing then. Uh, it is apparent from the first strophe that there was an expectation among the community of faith who had their center in Jerusalem, Zion, that the Lord would alter uh, their lot. They were so sure of God's intervention that they experienced it in advance as a reality. Um, so that that's something I was just so shocked to see in here. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, let's keep reading, so maybe we'll try to understand well, what the he commentaries also, are saying. He also says that uh, the interpretation proposed, among others, by Hans Joachim Kraus, that the exiles have already returned from Babylonia but are now praying for the full restoration of the national home, seems strained. Yeah, it's, it is pretty weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. So that's, this is kind of, okay. sorry, uh, did you have to finish the verse? Sorry. No, no, that, that, that's the end of verse three. Okay, that was the end of verse three. Okay, never mind. Then uh, we, can, we can continue. <laughs> okay. Rest restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. So uh the, the freshets in the Negev. Yes, yeah, so the Negev. <laughs> yeah, no, the the Negev was that uh kind of the Saudi Arabia region in the south. Mm. Right. That yeah, that whole area. So it's really interesting that uh they use that that phrase. Yeah, it says the references to wadis or dry water gulches that with the onset of the rainy season are filled with streams of water. Yeah, uh, Wadi is uh, the Egyptian um, valley. Mm. So uh, he's talking about, in Arabians, yep. they're talking about some elements uh, of, of joy. Uh, and they note that, uh, secondly, the Lord's acts of salvation were such that the other nations were obliged to take note of them. Uh, God's acts of salvation have an international dimension. The expression restore the fortunes uh, places the emphasis 
on the Lord's power to change the situation radically through a miraculous intervention. So it, it is kind of a weird one to understand because so they just got the temple back, right? Because mm-hmm. um, it already has been restored. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming this is already post-exilic, but then they continue uh, to also want things from the Negev. So this is actually... Um, this is actually a really interesting point, talking point, because Romer, uh, so, uh, I mean, he's working off of, you know, plenty of scholarship, uh, and other people agree with him, like uh, uh, Finkelstein also agrees with him on this, that the origin of the, well, you know, the Israelites, or the pre-Israelites, I suppose, would be from that region, from the Negev. That's why there's so much stuff about uh, from the Mount of Sair and from Sinai. And now uh, we have this reference to the Negev. Uh, so there's just more evidence that they want to, that they came from that region initially. That That's what I can gather from this. Mm. All right. Well... Landon, why don't you All right. continue? So we have... Oh, a phone call. Um, so, no, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm blocking, all right. blocking, 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 blocking. <laughs> <laughs> I was just uh, all right. taken aback by the all ringing. Right. <laughs> Never mind. Um those who saw those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting i got he, i'll go over yeah. verse six I, I thought you wanted to have commentary per oh per yeah that's verse. true <laughs> yeah the long cycle of the agricultural year beginning in the labor of planting and concluding with the fulfillment of the harvest is an eloquent metaphor for a structure of historical time that moves from a difficult present to a happy future. That idea of reversal through time is neatly reinforced by the tight antithetical chiasm of the line A, A, so B in tears, B in glad song, A, reap. The term Rina, glad song, is the thematic thread that ties the psalm together, appearing in verse 2, here, and again in verse 6. It is as though this psalm, a prayer for the national restoration that is presumably sung or chanted, were striving to turn into glad song. And then I just have, mm. uh, once you finish the, the psalm, Landon, I do have a note. So mm-hmm. yeah, go ahead whenever. Okay. So he, he who goes to and fro weeping and carrying his bag of seed shall indeed come again with a shout of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. So uh, that uh, imagery. And it's a psalm. So the imagery of sowing seeds is prominent. Uh, and it, it's pretty much another say another way to say the same thing as the rest of the psalm, and uh, it's actually in uh, Erdman notes. Uh, it's the key to interpreting the psalm as a whole. The metaphor expresses the expectation that the situation of distress will be changed into good fortune by the Lord, uh, which we can definitely tell that. But it, it is really hard to understand uh, what exactly they are now asking for because yeah i mean we get that you know they they want the negev apparently um actually hold on restore our fortunes oh lord like streams in the negev so i guess they're not asking for the negev right. they so those were recent semi recently restored i don't know when when the streams of the negev would have uh I'm not sure what it means that yeah it's a well, Alter said that it's a reference to the wadis. Sure. That fill with water during the rainy season. Okay, so right. just during the rainy season. Right, gotcha. but um, <laughs> this last footnote that he has here, the language he uses is ridiculous. Or maybe it's just restore our fortunes as in they want to get as big as they used to be. Mm. Yeah. Uh, but this language he has in this last footnote is ridiculous. He says, 
the effectiveness of these two concluding lines of the poem, with their neat interlinear antithetical parallelism, is the unadorned directness of the parallel syntactic semantic structure, and it seems a mistake to convert the lines into explanatory subordinate syntax. Hold on there, Jordan <laughs> Peterson. Can you speak English? For example, yeah. by yeah. placing <laughs> a though at the beginning of the of verse six, as several modern translations <laughs> do. Rather, we are invited to envision um, and to envisage two coordinate images separated in time and precisely antithetical in meaning. He walks along Halo Kielek. Then he will surely come in, Bo Yavo, the same emphatic structure of infinitive followed by imperfective verb. Come in refers to coming in from the fields after binding the sheaves of grain. Sure. Yes. But I thought that it was hilarious the way that he phrased everything that was, in that was That was horrible. That was so bad. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, how about we hop into well, the next psalm then, shall we? Yeah. I'll, I'll take that. Well, 127, but to, to give this theme, 127 is actually a very interesting prime. <laughs> it's a Mersenne prime because it's 2 to the 7th minus 1 is 127. And it's a Mersenne power because 2 to the 127th power minus 1 is prime. Ah, okay. But we don't know if 2 to the half minus 1 is prime. So, so 2 to the 3rd minus 1 is 7. Two to the seventh minus one is one twenty-seven. This Psalm chapter two to one hundred twenty-seven minus one is also prime. All those are prime, but two to that minus one we don't know. But I searched up to like fifty-one digit primes and didn't find a factor. So, I mean that I that is the psalmist understood that, but uh, but it's a momentous, uh, uh, an important number. So. Wonderful. <laughs> that's Every, so that's something everyone that, today. That's something yes. that Landon. Uh, you know, that, that was kind of how he made his name, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. Those uh, yeah. pristine primes? Yeah. Well, I took a good yeah. chunk of it. Yeah. Two times, yeah. my friend. Is very <coughs> Two this is a nice, a nice, a nice Mersin Prime chapter number, so <laughs> yay, Mersin yeah. Primes. And that's as close as we're ever getting to biblical numerology. <laughs> 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 anyway. Psalm 127. Song of a sense of Solomon. Is good. Yeah. It says a song of a sense of Solomon. Yeah. This one. Yeah. So the title of Solomon <coughs> is neither an indication of authorship nor a clue to the original historical situation. The reason why the psalm is ascribed to Solomon is probably that Solomon was often associated with wisdom. Furthermore, Solomon was also known as Jedediah. Uh, which means beloved of the Lord. Mm. And apparently we can cross-reference that with, uh, we can cross-reference verse 2 with Second Samuel twelve twenty-five. Okay. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows. For so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. So, uh, think to note here. Uh, so much he gives to his loved one in sleep. This whole verse set is rather crabbed in the Hebrew. Uh, in the Masoretic text, one finds a singular loved one, though two manuscripts and the Septuagint and Syriac show a plural. The spelling of sleep, shena, with an, uh, with an aleph instead of a he at the end is odd, and the word lacks the prepositional prefix <coughs> in. Uh, that one might expect. The somewhat conjectural meaning, which many interpreters propose, is that while people labor long and hard to earn their bread, God gives just as much 
to those he favors even while they sleep. I bet Chris would love that. What? <laughs> Get a bunch of bread while you sleep. No. From, from God himself. I don't want to wake up next to piles of bread. <laughs> <laughs> like an equal amount that I would eat during the day. Oh, yeah. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with the enemies in the gate. So uh, I do have a uh, note on this from Erdemans. So it says, uh, sons are like arrows in the hands of a soldier. This means that children are a powerful defense against attack and a source of security against danger. Another perspective is added in verse 4b, namely that children born while their parents are still young are a weapon against the miseries of old age. Got to have someone take care of you. Uh, and then it talks about, you know, someone's, uh, you know, the quiver being full uh, but the way I interpreted that was kind of like a, just like a parenthood thing. Mm-hmm. Like with the power of God, the children of God can prosper. Well, the way that the psalm starts off, it's like, well, nothing happens unless God wants it to happen, right? So, uh, and then it goes on to say that you should have children, right? <laughs> um, this is like the Abraham thing, right? And go Kinda, forth, yeah. multiply, be fruitful. Well, that was at the very beginning. Yeah, at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, that was like that was uh, very early in Genesis. That wasn't the Abraham thing. Yeah, that was the God thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you said uh, it a bunch. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and then you know there are plenty of references to you know having right a uh, population as you know uh, it, it's as big as there's as numerous as the stars or as numerous. Ah, yes, Genesis again. Thank you. Yeah, and, you know, breaking you know. it down, it's basically like stuff happens because God wants it to have kids because they can protect you from things. Yeah, pretty much, especially when you're old. Yeah. Very nice, very nice Jewish girl. Yes, all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> How wise. Uh anyways. It's the end of the th- Psalm. That was the end of Psalm 127, the yeah. most mathematically pleasing Psalm there is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to hop in to Well, 128 is just, just a nice power of two. What can you say? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a fun. Power. It's classic. It's a classic power of two. Yep. And according to Eerdmans, um, there's also elements of wisdom literature and like, you know, good fertility stuff in this psalm too. Ah, so fantastic. It's going to be basically the same. <laughs> Maybe. A song of a sense. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands. You shall be blessed, and it shall be well with you. Uh, So, when you eat with the toil of your hands, this line stands in contrast to sundry biblical curses such as those in Deuteronomy 28. Ah, uh, yeah, you remember Deuteronomy 28? That was nuts. You can go back and uh, listen to our reading of that. It was, it was pretty nuts. crazy. That the people will toil and others will eat the fruit of their labor. It should be observed that the good life is not imagined in terms of wealth, but of sufficiency, a man's enjoying the fruit of his own labor. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. She will be a brood mare. <laughs> that doesn't say that. That was me adding the. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I got that. I moved the camera back to the normal angle, and it's not your reading. Uh, your children will be like olive shoots around your table. <laughs> Great. Behold! 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 Landon. Behold! Thus shall be the man be blessed. Thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. So that's that's your blessing. A lot of kids. You got 
someone to make children for they, you. They they gave you the benefits of that yep. earlier. You know, they were like, true. hey, listen, you get somebody who'll help you later or yeah, whatever. That's I true. Guess. Yay. Yep. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. So this is really interesting mm-hmm. that he blesses you from Zion because we're going back to that whole Jerusalem being the seat of God thing. Yeah. That's his house. That's where he lives. Yeah. He's not everywhere. He's there. That's why you got to go there. Yeah. May you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Peace. Well, so I've, I've got a bit here. How did that turn out? Um, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> From Eerdmans, by drawing a parallel between the family and the nation and integrating the one with the other, Psalm 128 shows us how these two social institutions may influence one another for good. Mm. If the family is healthy, so is the society as a whole and vice versa. Psalms 127 and 128 could be regarded as twin psalms and were probably deliberately placed alongside each other. Beside the fact that they are both wisdom psalms and they contain the expression, happy is, there is also great similarity regarding themes. Mm -hmm. The family, children, and descendants working and uh, work and the city are common themes. Nevertheless, the psalms elucidate the same matters from different perspectives, where Psalm 127 says that all human activities are meaningless without the presence of the Lord. Psalm 128 emphasizes human initiative and entrepreneurial spirit, which is blessed and rewarded by God. In the terms of Psalm 128, human beings and God cooperate to create a successful life. While people have to fulfill their responsibilities, it is the Lord who blesses human endeavor. And I would assume that there was a reason it was placed so closely to 126 as well. Mm. Yeah. Either way, that's the end of that psalm. Yep. Yeah, that was Psalm 128. Very short psalms today, of course. That's why we're covering 11 of them. Yeah. These are those sort of little Sami psalms, yes. So, uh, um, Landon, we're going to pass it off to you 129. for 129. Yep. Uh, and is there yeah, anything I'm, special about 129? <laughs> uh, yeah, tell us. Well, I guess two things. Um, it certainly is, is two to the eighth plus one. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one more than the power of two. Um, it is not prime. It's a little by three. But 129 is the sum of the first absolute value of one minus two minus nine primes. You know, the digits 129, if you take one minus two minus nine absolute value, it's uh-huh. the sum of that many primes. Okay. The first, that many uh-huh. primes. So I, I, you have to start reaching for some of these things. <laughs> the sum, I was going to say. The, sum of, uh, the, 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 the prayer for the overthrow of Zion's enemies might, might be even more instructive. Oh, good. Can't wait. All right. Many times ha- they have persecuted me from my youth up. Let Israel now say. So. Uh, many times the- they have persecuted me from my youth up. But they already said that. Mm. <laughs> it, it says here. I'm sorry. The first person it language. Says- it makes this initially sound like an individual complaint. But as the reference to the haters of Zion in verse five indicates, and the first and the let Israel now say says, yeah, uh, the first person is speaking yeah. on behalf of the nation, and the enemies referred to are probably foreign oppressors that have conquered Judah. That would make yeah. sense. So, so let me read. read. Let me read the, read the first two verses again so mm-hmm. people can get the idea of the reputation. Many times they have persecuted me from my youth up. Let Israel now say, many times they have persecuted from my youth up, and yet they have not prevailed against me. So this, this, the psalmist is the speaking as Israel. Upon my back. Mm-hmm. Yes. The powers have plowed upon my back. They have lengthened their furrows. The Lord is righteous. He has cut into the cords of the wicked. The cords of the Thomas? wicked. Is that... Uh, I, 
They found yeah. my secret weapon. Umbilical cords or <laughs> he has slashed the bonds yeah. of the wicked. Mm, okay. That's different. I was using those. Uh, I actually do have um No, that's later. Never mind. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So second second stanza uh four verses. May all those who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them who be like grass upon the housetops, which withers before it grows up, with which the reaper does not fill his hand or the binder sheaths his bosom. Nor do those who pass by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you, who bless you in the name of the Lord. So uh, the one note pretty I have, song. yeah, it is pretty odd. The The only note that I have from Erdman's here, the agricultural metaphor is continued, but it is loaded with irony. The labor of the plowers produces no harvest. So, you know, we had the labor of the plowers before, but then in verse 7, uh, the, in which the reaper does not fill his hands uh, <clears throat> because they plowed on shallow ground. Uh, the work of the tillers receives no blessing. The implication is clear. The enemies of Israel have not achieved their purpose. Israel is saved, but its enemies perish. Mm. And for, uh, for dates, the psalm probably dates from the post-exilic period when the people had little hope for the future. The intention of the psalm is to tell the people of God that if they put their trust in him, there is always hope. Well, there's a, a few notes here. Uh, the grass on rooftops, it's a reference to thatched roofs, uh, which apparently wither really quickly. Uh, but instead of it saying uh, what Landon's did in Alter's version, it says, may they be like the grass on rooftops that the east wind withers. The east wind. Yes, okay. it says uh, the Masoretic text, Shekadmat uh, Shalaf Yavesh, is opaque. One might translate it as before it is pulled up, it dries out. Well, it would be a problem if it were transparent. There, that's better. Thank you. <laughs> but the Aramaic form of the first word is peculiar, and the grammar of the second word, it shows the form of an active transitive verb, is wrong. The translation follows an emendation first proposed by Ermin Gunkel, Shekadim Tishov. I've been reading a lot about uh, Gunkel recently, actually. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Is he cool? Uh, he, stre- he makes a lot of uh, stretches. Mm-hmm. But uh, the Lord's blessing upon you, we bless you in the name of the Lord. It says, um, these words are fairly close to the exchange of greetings between Boaz and the harvesters in Ruth. Two, four. So one may assume that such formulas of mutual blessing were customarily exchanged between repeat, uh, reapers and passerbys, uh, passersby during the harvest, itself a season of blessing through the produce of the fields. For this reason, it makes better sense to construe we bless you in the name of the Lord as part of this harvest dialogue and not as a liturgical benediction at the end of the psalm. In Ruth, it should be observed, both Boaz and the harvesters pronounce blessings. Yeah, I never would have thought that the stuff Hmm. from Ruth would have popped up that much because it was so short, there wasn't really much I thought we could get from it. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess we have gotten something from it, and that's good. Yeah. Yeah. About time. Yeah. So anyways. Uh, but I, I, I doubt this particular psalm is quoted many times or sung many times. This doesn't seem like a very useful psalm. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say some bad stuff about the psalms, but. <laughs> All right, uh, let's... This is not one of the better ones. So I put it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Uh, let's hop into Psalm 130 then, shall we? Mm-hmm. Um, if you're enjoying the, the stream so far, it's the only yes. number. You, you tell us about the the I'm s- the stream quick, yeah. And 
Uh, but if you're trying to stream so far, please give a like and subscribe and, and Patreon and buy t-shirts and all good stuff. Um, <laughs> no, 130 is the only number who's equal to the sum of the squares of its first four divisors. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> wow. Finally, knowledge no. I can put to use immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's first four divisors, one, two, five, and ten, and the sum of the squares of those is one third. So, we have a good intro to one. As good an intro to Psalm one thirty as you probably ever can get. So, uh, for Psalm one thirty, uh, there isn't really that much a Santa. It is an individual lament, but uh, so I'm going to, they actually do have extra commentary on it, which mm. is, they have never had that for an individual lament. They usually no, just they put in brackets. Here's an individual lament. Oh. Go see these, uh, these pages over here. So although most exegetes rightly place Psalm 130 among the individual laments, it does show uh, great similarities with the other songs of ascent. So that is why, uh, that's why it's there, I suppose. So how about we hop right into that then, shall we? Yep. Psalm 130. Yeah. It says, by the way, hope in the Lord. It says, in my thing, the title is hope in the Lord's forgiving love. Mm. Mine just says a song of degrees. <laughs> Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. So repeatedly... In Psalms, the depths are an epithet for the depths of the sea, which in turn is an image of the realm of the dead. Generations of readers, Christian and Jewish, have responded to the archetypal starkness of this phrase. The speaker, from the darkness of profound despair on the verge of death, calls out to God. This psalm, of course, is a penitential psalm focusing not on the evil of Israel's enemies, as does Psalm 129, but on the wrongs Israel has done. It resembles Psalm 129 in beginning with the first person singular that turns into the expression of a collective plea, as the last two verses make clear. So yeah, that's why, you know, for the last one, I was noting that it kind of turned the psalmist himself as a mouthpiece for Israel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it makes sense. All right. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If thou, Lord, shouldst mark iniquities, mm. O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. Mm. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. So uh, there's... there's. You did say that? He did. Yeah. Um, so Ultra's translation <laughs> is, My being for the master, more than the dawn, watchers watch for the dawn. Very weird. Hard to understand. No, uh, I, I had a job that? for a place called First Watch once. Round of applause. Yep. Play play the sound Ooh. effect. <laughs> That's, I think that was the wrong one. That was the wrong one. No, it was the right one. <laughs> I, maybe that was the right one. <laughs> no, I don't think it was. Yes. Uh, so there's actually quite a long note for this, Nalter. Uh, previous translators have all supplied a predicate here. Uh, is eager, is turned to, or the King James versions waiteth, duly italicized to show that it is merely implied in the Hebrew. But the power of the line in the original is precisely that the anticipated verb uh, wait, having appeared with its synonym hoped in the preceding line, is choked off. My inner being, my utmost self, for God more than watchmen uh, watch for the dawn. The Hebrew noun uh, boker also has the more general sense of mourning. Uh, but in this context of watchmen through the night awaiting the first light, dawn is strongly indicated. Previous translators render the four Hebrew words mishormim la boker, shomrim la boker uh, as a simple repetition. For example, the New Jewish Publication Society. 
That's not the one we have. No, we have the Jewish Publication Society. Yeah. Uh, I don't know who these new Jews <laughs> are, but these uh, well, the likelihood is the you new could ones. Maybe find out because they're newer. <laughs> <laughs> the the newer Jews, <laughs> the newer Jews, uh, say. Uh, the quote is, uh, then watchman of the morning, watchman for the morning. But shomrim can be either a verbal noun, watchman, or a plural verb, watch. The line becomes more vivid and energetic if the second occurrence is understood as a verb more than the watchman watch for the dawn. I watch. Uh, yeah, more than the watchman watch for the dawn. I watch. Uh, elliptically implied for the Lord. The force of the image is evident. The watchman sitting through the lit, through the last of the three watches of the night, peering into the darkness for the first sign of dawn, cannot equal my intense expectancy for God's redeeming word to come to me in my dark night of the soul. That was the note. Nice. Quite, a, quite a long one, but it was a very confusing verse. Yeah. Let Israel yeah. hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous Mm. redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Good. That's the end of the psalm. If you guys are enjoying the stream so far, drop a like, subscribe, share it around. All that good stuff to Uh, homeless people that are probably not in the street anymore. I'm I'm not sure sharing it around is... uh, Wave to your neighbor. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yes, wave to them and and get their attention and have them go in and and watch it. Don't don't keep keep a social distance away, but 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 socially engage them to come back and watch the stream. Here's what should be done: you should write the link down on a sheet of paper. It's always that. And then and then you need to turn it into a paper airplane, and then you need to throw it at your neighbors. Right. From six feet away. Yes. But at, before you do so, you want you you want to to like put it with a you know a spread disinfectant over it and yeah. and 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 toss it that way. It might be all wet and I was thinking, incapable of flying. I was thinking yeah. you'd use like a Lego machine to like print it and then like make paper airplanes and shoot it automatically so that no human hand touched it in the process. <laughs> you know, all important stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A paper. Oh, I wonder. No, no. Nobody probably has ever made a gun that assembles paper airplanes and shoots. Oh, them. yeah, yes, they have. There's, there's the Lego contraption I literally was referring to. Mark yes. Rober. There's yes. a made one of those. It's a gun. No, it's huge. You it, hold it over your shoulder, and it makes some. And, and it you takes can just it, fire and a sheet of paper, and it folds it, mm-hmm. and then launches it. That's and right. Pew 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 pew. Yeah, Mark yes. Rober actually made one of those. That's ridiculous. Caltech they did it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's a popular, fun thing to do for hobbyists on YouTube that want to show off Man. their engineering. Yeah. So, either way. The, yeah, yeah but sorry but to I break. I was do, brainstorming do what the next button, uh, goal is supposed to be because after alchemy, we have... We'll come up with something. In fact, we'll probably come up with it after I, the show. I would... Ra- yeah, I, I have some recommendations after the show we can talk about. So, if, if you're a Patreon, you can join... Yeah, ab- absolutely. Oh, yeah. But, Lawrence, why don't you read this psalm that's only three verses? <laughs> yeah, three verses. Uh, psalm so, 131. So 131. It's a palindrome, right? It reads forward and backwards. Yeah. Yes, and that is true. the first 131 non-primes is prime. And the, the values either side of 131 have, it's, it's the smallest prime that's that the numbers on either side have three distinct factors exactly. So, wow. 131. And they're all right. odd. One, three, and one. Yes, yeah. uh-huh. that's true. Odd oh, that. man. Amazing. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So, Psalm 131, last psalm of the day. Is, is there any uh, notes for this? Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm. As a wisdom text with a didactic I function. Is the song of a stance of David? Uh, mine does say yes of David. Yes. Uh, as a wisdom text with a didactic function, Charlotte. the psalm aims to teach people that the practice of self-aggrandizement 
should be abandoned. So actually, I did leave mm-hmm. a note for that. Um, Ooh, yeah. Um, I know, I know, my handwriting is hard to read, but I remember what I was going to say. So remember the acrostic. Do you remember near the very end where the psalmist was pretty much saying, like, I have all this knowledge. I am. You know, yeah. so much smarter than these other guys. Yeah. So that's some self-aggrandizement. Mm-hmm. But this is going to be a condemnation of self-aggrandizement. Mm-hmm. Yes, Which, but but that guy's going to talk about how great he is at not doing it. <laughs> uh, it says uh, the wisdom character of this psalm and its position in this collection point to the post-exilic period. The message of Psalm one thirty one would have been eminently suited to the time of crisis. Mm. A song of ascents of David. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. It says... uh, I told you he'd do it, and here he (laughs) is. I didn't mean it, though. I was kidding. uh, What a simpleton. Nor have I striven for great things. It says um, the literal sense of the Hebrew is gone about in or among great things. Uh, uh, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child for its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Oh, Israel... Hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. And that's the end of Psalm 131. All right, so the last verse. Uh, what a psalm. The last verse is either a, either this conclusion on a collective note is an editorial edition or the condition of quiet contentment of the speaker is being proposed as a model for how a trusting Israel should wait for the Lord. And that's like it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's yeah. really about and it. And thus endeth the lesson. Where's the other? Thus endeth the lesson. Yes. <laughs> So, if you guys enjoyed the stream, make sure you drop a like, subscribe if you haven't, all that good stuff, share it around, people can watch it afterwards. Uh, and we are hope, we are hope, we hope you are having. We're the manifestation of hope, <laughs> hope you knew that. We are hope. <laughs> we hope you are having a happy quarantine. Yeah. Yes. And a uh and you just got Yay. the video demonetized for referencing a quarantine. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So mm. we are going to come up with a new uh, you know, uh new drive after the show, a new six 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 drive. We're also coming out with a new shirt. But no, That's we true. must we must thank but we must thank uh, you know, flip uh one one seven one zero zero. Of course. Yes, thank uh, you I so have much. Done it without you. you really kind of. Thank you, Flip. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, other than that, Landon, do you have uh, anything to shill out? Anything people should should know about? Actually, we got to do we got to do some end shilling, anyways. Oh, you this. should pay. You 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 certainly should pay attention to the Comet Atlas, which is fragmenting. If particularly if you're in the southern hemisphere, it might put on a good show because when it fragments, it gets more surface area, and might be brighter and and more fun. So we hope that. Uh, Comet Atlas uh, puts on a good show for those in the uh, South. That does sound fun. I'd like to like to see that stuff. Huh. Uh, anyways, then our shilling. We got a Patreon. You yeah. could even be on the show. Yeah, Landon's on the Patreon. Yeah, yeah uh, you can get t-shirts. Landon won yeah, the t-shirt and, this and, month. And you can win t-shirts. Like this this t-shirt. See? Behold. Yes, behold. That's behold. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yes. Speaking of behold, somewhere intermittently between this shilling, we've got our count for today, which is three beholds. Three beholds. Three I would beholds. have said last week's, but it was a beheld, a beholding, and a behold. And right. I wrote those out and forgot to show them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's see. What else do we have? We have an Amazon wish list. Yeah, if you want to get us stuff that we'll actually reference and read on here. They're all books, by the way. Everything on the wish list is books. Someday it might be some tech, you know? We could use Maybe. an upgrade in like a year. 
but yeah. we always we could also use backup equipment but, that when but, we don't have it. So it's nice that everything works, thank goodness. But someday mm -hmm. your support is necessary. Thank you very much. But so far, you've folks, got us what we got folks, so far. If you if you buy the books, yes, 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 if you buy the books, then they act could become commentary and other interesting things. So you actually are investing in your own show by buying the books. Yeah, you get more yeah. information. Uh, and let's see what else we got. Uh, yeah, just regular stuff on Teespring. Yeah, if you just yep. want the shirt. wacky and fun T-shirts up there for you. We've got a new one coming out. That's uh, according to some Jews, at least. Yes, the according Ooh. to some Jews shirt. Yeah, which so, computer? You mean Lawrence's computer? Oh yeah, we, Lawrence needs a new computer. Yeah, I mean my computer works fine for plenty of other things. Just uh, I don't know why Landon's uh, all laggy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> either way. Uh, well, a Photoshop subscription would be super dope because I'm really not uh, familiar with GitHub. And even though I've tried to familiarize myself with it, it is wonky. I just don't like it. It's not as appealing to me after all the years of training and bias I've developed on a Photoshop. So I've got a Mac. We've got an extra computer and a screen and a tablet for drawing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I did use it when I had Photoshop. <laughs> I don't anymore. So Yeah. Uh, so by the way, all that stuff links are in the description, and also Twitter and Facebook. It's free to yeah, follow us there. Yeah, those things are free. Yes. The, um, there's also Lawrence's book. Ah, uh, no, according to, to your evidence, unicorns exist. Not very know. good. I think we but sent you, one to Landon, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Did, yeah. I have. I have. I have, I have that book. I feel. I feel, I even read it. <laughs> <laughs> I read wow, it that's, too. That's something. Uh, it's uh, it's a whatever. But but you you, you, have, you have some videos coming up that you're doing some some uh, extra extra video stuff. Oh uh, yeah, the Deuteronomistic history video is gonna come out shortly. Tomorrow. Yep. It's coming out tomorrow, and it will be premiered so we can wow. watch it with you. Yep. Yeah. And uh, Ooh. aside from that, I am you know I, I had a lot of stuff to do last week. Just a lot of school stuff and like everything else uh, wow. preparing for our uh, second Maccabees reading. So qu I had quite a lot to do, but I am now getting back into the flow of reading stuff for the video on the historicity of Abraham. Ah. So that's going to come up at some point once I get through the mountain of reading I have to do for that. But that He's one I'm not sure... a historical figure. No, he isn't. Uh, so That'll be the video going to discuss uh, potential hey, evidence. Spoiler, and... spoiler, spoiler. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, sorry for the spoiler, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, so that one's going to be interesting, I think. I think that one will hopefully do as well or almost as well as the Lilith video. Yeah, that one well, hopefully it does be better. Even better. Yeah, yeah hopefully. hopefully it's the most popular video on the channel. Be, I ho hope that for every video, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So either way, thank you everyone for joining us. And, and join us next time because we will see you on see you Friday. See you on Friday, but and it's Sunday, Sunday as well. Both Friday and Sunday. On Friday and Sunday. In one word. <laughs> <laughs>